Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of RPGs with Paddy. I'm Paddy. So I'm really doing my best to get out weekly reviews to you. So uh, I would really appreciate if you could like the video, only if you actually like it of course, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm hoping to run through the whole back catalogue of Cthulhu by Gaslight scenarios and the resources before the release of the new one, which we still don't have a date for. Uh, Chaosium are doing their best to, to stop me though by releasing the new version of the Arkham source book. Uh, I just bought it today and it looks fantastic. I'm going to spend the weekend looking into it in more detail. Uh, anyway, today we're going to be looking at the fifth scenario from the collection Sacraments of Evil, and this scenario is called The Scuttling. This is rather a unique scenario in a lot of ways that I'll get into after the spoiler warning, but before then I think I can safely give a bit of information to any players out there. So you're contacted by a rich tycoon, Nigel Stander, uh, who has sourced a very unique statue in New York. You are to travel there by boat, pay the money, which he will give you, and return it safely to him here in London. You'll be rewarded handsomely, and you'll even get some money down. Not only that, but Stander is someone who it would be very beneficial to be on good terms with, particularly in Victorian England, where status and connections are what matters most. Okay, so I think that's all we can get into for now. Uh, so if you haven't played this scenario, you should stop here to avoid spoilers. But if you're thinking of running it, or if you've already played it, or if you just can't resist juicy secret spoilers, let's get into it. So uh, as I mentioned, the scuttling is a unique scenario where about 80% of the scenario takes place on a boat. And not only that, but the monsters involved are not connected to the Lovecraftian mythos at all. They're called Eurypterids. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. Uh, but these are real creatures from the Paleozoic era. Uh, the core plot is actually very simple and straightforward. But uh, this review will seem a little bit longer because there's a lot of additional material provided which really fleshes out the scenario well. The name of the scenario has a double meaning, uh, both of which come up in this scenario. Of course, scuttling a ship means to purposely sink it, uh, but also the sound that these creatures make moving around the wooden ship is scuttling. Um, there are a lot of aspects of this scenario that hint at the short story The Temple by Lovecraft, but that is actually complete misdirection. The Temple is a great, great story, uh, one of my favourites actually, and I highly recommend uh, either reading it or listening to it. Uh, Go Tanabe has a great graphic novel, I don't know if that's going to show up, uh, depicting uh, it. I only have the Japanese version, and it's in this collection if you're looking for it. There's an English version out there as well. Uh, really beautiful uh, illustrations, kind of showing it all. Um, very immersive for a lot of Cthulhu stuff. Uh, Lovecraft stuff. Um, but you can also find dramatic readings of it on both the Horror Babble channel and another channel called MSA Matthew. The latter uses illustrations from Go Tanabe's book, uh, hopefully with permission. Uh, so it's really, really immersive to experience it that way. I will be pointing out some spoiler, minor spoilers, I guess, about that story here. So please skip ahead until this marker. Here or here, I haven't decided yet. This spoiler marker is gone if you don't want to know anything about the temple story. Uh, as I said, it's a misdirection for the players, so it's not actually connected to this scenario. So uh, the connections that we have with the temple, of course, you have the ocean connection. Uh, there's a scene where another ship passes by, although it doesn't result in battle as it does in the temple. Uh, dolphins appear twice, like in the temple. Uh, you have a statue or bust that the crew seems to think is cursed, and they want to throw it overboard. So this scenario can be great for misdirection if your players have already read that story. Although it's not one of Lovecraft's most popular or most famous ones, and it is also notably non-mythos. It's more likely that your players have not read that, so all that misdirection might be a little bit wasted, uh, depending on your players. Uh, this scenario can be good as a one-shot, or during a period of quiet for the investigators, because they have to spend about two months away from England 
uh, which may not be possible with certain pre-existing characters from other games that you've played. Um, however, there is a wide range of suggested suitable occupations for this scenario, so it is quite flexible. Anyway, the investigators are summoned by an ultra-rich tycoon, Nigel Stander, who wants them to oversee the purchase of a rare statue in New York and bring it back safely. It's a bust of Lady Jane Grey. Uh, there's some information given here about her, but basically she succeeded Edward VI and was queen for just nine days. Uh, Edward's half-sister Mary, Mary I, took the throne and Lady Jane Grey was executed, uh, I think, the next year. And she was only 16 or 17 at the time. And the piece is being held by an antique dealer in New York called Wyman and DeMarco. Uh, they have arranged the sum of 500 British pounds. Stander will pay the investigators 40 pounds now for their trouble and 40 pounds upon their return. He will also cover the travel costs and will uh, reimburse them for any reasonable expenses. Uh, so he hands them over uh, various communications and legal documents. Uh, he gives them train tickets to get them to Liverpool uh, for a boat which will leave in two days. If the investigators have any questions, he can answer them here, and he's done a lot of research about this, uh, and there is good detail given in the scenario. So all of this should show how investigators of any occupation and any class would fit into this scenario, from like high-class investigators who are interested in their nation's history, to professionals such as lawyers or academic professionals and historians, and lower-class people as well, either employees of standard. Uh, or some extra muscle that they want for the for the journey. Uh, the investigators are free to do a bit of their own research, but as I said, Stander has already really done most of the research on this. Um, there's no extra information given for what the investigators could find. It kind of assumes that they get on uh, the train and head to Liverpool uh, the next day. Um, arriving at the dock, there's a little bit of confusion here. Uh, the first ship that you meet is not the one that you're going to be on, uh, but you can easily get around this by asking about it or checking the flags, uh, uh, checking the ship's flag or the ship's name to realize that it's the wrong one. Uh, but there is some dialogue here. It's good if you want to bring out your terrible Scandinavian accent for the crew of the wrong ship. Uh, the investigators should probably realize as well, and you probably don't have to point it out to them, that being late will start them off on the wrong foot with the captain. So when they get to the uh, Christabel, which is their ship, uh, they'll meet the crew, and this means quite a number of NPCs. There is a list of sample crewmen at the end of the scenario, but I think some time could have been spent introducing key members for what's to come. So I'm just going to, I'll briefly introduce them here and kind of tell you what the key things are. Uh, Dan Holly is the captain. He will treat the investigators well, but he does expect them to follow orders and not cause a fuss. Uh, by follow orders, uh, the investigators are not expected to do any work, but you can't just do whatever you want on a ship as well. The captain is in charge. Uh, Niles Van Owen is the first mate. Uh, he's strong and silent. Michael O'Reilly is the second mate, and he's in charge of the ship's crew, uh, kind of like a manager. And Joe Carr is the ship's cook. So uh, there is information given about them, but uh, their connections I'll explain later, just right now. Um, there's a variety of crew and you can have kind of as many as you want and think about once you hear the rest of the scenario, think about how many you would want to die before the investigators are really at risk. But here are some of the key crewmen that you should definitely include. Um, Higgins uh, is one and he gets in an early argument with Gordon and he gets in a fight with uh, Hawkins later on. Uh, Gordon he's he gets into an argument with Higgins in one of the scenes and he's the second crewman to die as written. Carr is the cook but he has a fist fight with Hawkins down below and Carr is one of the ones that dies as written in the scenario um, to the monsters. Hawkins he fights with Carr and he fights with Higgins later on and uh, yeah, he, he's kind of like a core guy because the crew actually start to suspect him of the murders. Um, Oldfield is the, the kind of the the, sta the standard helmsman in this one, and he is going to be the first one to die when things start going wrong. 
And finally, Tork Tork Kilson. Um, uh, he is one of the crew members, but he will replace Carr as the cook after Carr dies. Uh, there are some other crew members there as well, but these are kind of the ones that come up in the events listed in the book. Uh, you could easily change names, of course, as well. Uh, as I said, the key relations that I would include are Carr, the cook, is close friends with Higgins, and that Carr, again, the cook, hates Hawkins and treats him really badly. And that'll make sense a little bit later. So the journey to New York lasts for about a month. The goal of the Keeper, I think, is to get the investigators used to life on a ship, which should be quite different from previous adventures. Uh, the scenario describes the ship layout in good detail, and an important note is that people of different social classes will likely eat in different sections. Uh, upper class investigators will probably eat with the officers, while lower classes will eat with the crew in the mess hall. Uh, the journey is long, about a month each way, so there are a few suggested good uses of your time. Uh, reading mythos tomes and learning mythos spells. You can also observe the running of a ship and you can gain points in pilot ship. And I guess if the investigators suggest anything else, they could improve their skills in that if it's reasonable. Uh, nothing substantially bad is going to happen on the way over to New York, but it is good to introduce a lot of events that happen on the ship. Uh, the players may be expecting something bigger to happen from the earlier events, like uh, that's this, this is a key event, but then it kind of winds down um, and it turns out it wasn't that important. And so the crew, sorry, the investigators kind of gradually get used to things happening on ships and not all of them, you know, being the big mythos reveal. And I think this kind of lulls them into a false sense of security, getting used to life on a ship. Uh, so now we are given a variety of events that can happen at the keeper's discretion. It suggested that they occur every one to three days and pretty much in any order that you like. I won't go into too much detail in all of them, uh, just a quick look. Uh, there's an argument between Higgins and Gordon. Uh, it's not so important, but just good to establish some tension. Uh, another time, the cook serves a bad batch of food and some people can get a little bit sick. Uh, and that might be uh, different depending on who's eating with the uh, officers and who's eating with the crew. Uh, another time, there is some floating trash, which is just an event. Uh, but an interesting and suggestive encounter is when there's some fuss created by the crew who see a monster at sea. Uh, so they call over the investigators and try to scare them. Uh, the investigators can catch glimpses of tentacles, which should definitely be uh, setting alarm bells ringing in their head. Uh, but it won't last too long because it's just a normal giant squid. Uh, if the investigators found out on their own that it's a giant squid, they'll have earned a bit of respect. But if the captain kind of explains it to them, or someone else does, the crew will keep teasing them about being scared for the rest of the journey. Uh, after that, there's a variety of weather conditions, fog for a while, a bad rain, a very calm sea with no wind so they can't move. Um, there were also an unusual number of rats found in the ship, causing some crewmen to go down with bats to kill them. There's another ship that passes by the Christabel, and the other ship doesn't really obey the unwritten laws when you meet another ship at sea, that you stop and you talk about weather conditions and, and heading and stuff like that. So the crew of the Christabel are kind of spoiling for a fight if they meet up with them in New York, which they do, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not an event. Another time, a pod of dolphins are seen near the ship, and that is a good omen. And finally, uh, this, this is an important one that you should definitely include, I think. Uh, there's a fight between Carr, the cook, and Hawkins. So I mentioned before that you should have been building up a bit of tension between these two, and this only really comes to fruition on the return journey. So uh, some of these events uh, you can do on the journey to New York, and you can leave some others until the return journey if you want, and you don't need to do them all. Uh, just remember not to overdo scenes where there's too much talking between NPCs uh, because that's just the Keeper talking to themselves. They These scenes can definitely be useful, but just make sure you're not dominating for too long while the investigators or the players are all watching you talk to yourself. Uh, so uh, after some or all of these events, you will arrive in New York. Uh, the sense of propriety standards in Victorian England is a bit relaxed here and the investigators might find that the barrier between them and the crew and the officers is a bit more relaxed here. 
Uh, you can stay on the ship at night or you can go and find a hotel. There is a little bit of extra material here, but it's not so important. Uh, one complication is that British money might not be accepted in various places. So you can present that as a problem for the investigator or you can just hand wave it. It's, it's fine. Um, getting to the Wyman and DeMarco an Antique Emporium should be your next step. So you, when you go in, the investigators will meet the owners, the two owners, and the namesakes of the Emporium. And after a quick inspection um, of, of the statue, uh, after some small talk, um, if you want to inspect the thing, you can find out if it's the real deal or not, but it's time to get down to business. Uh, Wyman hands over the documents to be signed. If the investigators sign without reading, they fail to notice that the contract states the price is £750, not the £500 uh, that was agreed to before. If they sign it, uh, they must pay that amount, uh, possibly having to wire England for more money. Um, if the investigators notice uh, before signing that the price has changed, they can question it and produce documents showing that the agreed upon price was £500. Uh, Weissman says that he has another interested party offering about £700. Uh, if Stander wants it, he can pay more money, is, is what he says. Uh, the investigators can try to negotiate the price down, but it won't go below that original £500. Uh, there is no other buyer. It's a blatant lie. Uh, but depending on what approach is taken, uh, whether aggressive or conciliatory by the investigators, Weissman's attitude towards them will change. Um, Weissman, but, you know, he he will sell them the item because he doesn't have another buyer. Uh, Weisman can arrange for the crate to be delivered to the boat for a small fee, but it will gradually get more expensive the more the investigators have annoyed him in this negotiation. Uh, if they really ruin their reputation with him, uh, Weisman will just put the crate with the statue out in the street and leave it for them to figure out how to get it to the ship. Uh, the rest of the day and the whole following day are free for the investigators to explore Manhattan, but there's no information given here in the scenario. It might be good to throw in a few minor things there. Uh, the investigators should make sure that they get back early on the morning of the third day to not delay uh, shipping out. If they inquire, the captain suggests that they should spend the last night uh, on the ship to avoid causing such a delay. Um, back on the ship, you can start adding in some events detailed earlier that you haven't already used, but there are a few new key events that happen on the return journey. Uh, the first one is the sea quake. Uh, this is, you know, the core event that happens. Uh, it's the event that really starts the rest of the scenario. The previous events were kind of to both get the investigators used to the daily run of life on a ship and also not to draw such attention to this event, hoping that it will kind of get lost in the shuffle of the other events. So uh, during the night on the second day after leaving New York, the sleeping investigators may or may not wake up to the sound of a lot of movement on deck and it has become extremely hot and humid. Uh, the captain will kind of call for them anyway if they don't wake up. Uh, out on deck the humidity is very high and there's a thick fog. Uh, O'Reilly puts a thermometer in the sea, pulls it back out claiming it to be 93 degrees or about 34 Celsius and then a listen roll will hear a strange popping sound. If anyone has geology they might be able to roll and find that this is some disturbance on the sea floor, maybe an earthquake or a volcano. Uh, everyone on the ship is kind of looking off to the side for this and no one is watching forward. Uh, any investigator who succeeds in a spot hidden roll will see that the ship is about to crash into some kind of land mass. If they spot it in time, they can shout to everyone to brace for impact. Um, but if they fail the spot hidden, there's a sudden crash and everyone takes some minor damage from being thrown about the ship. Really minor damage. Um, but anyway, the captain sees that the ship has kind of run aground on a soft mud bank and sends a few men to inspect it. Uh, when they get in, they sink up to their ankles in mud and the smell is awful. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any damage to the hull and the captain then decides to wait until first light and hope that the ship will free itself. Um, if not, he'll, uh, he'll tie the ship to the longboat get the longboat out and get the longboat to drag the main ship out of where it's stuck. 
Uh, the investigators can check out the mud bank if they want, although the captain does specifically say he won't risk his crew to rescue them if they get stuck out there, although in reality he probably would. Uh, there's nothing too interesting about the mud bank, but you can lose a shoe in the mud there, and you can also find some fossils. Uh, geology rolls will identify them as uh, something from the Silurian period, about 400 million years ago. Uh, this is kind of a hint of things to come. It's not necessarily important to the scenario, but it will help the investigators understand what's going on and where these creatures come from. Uh, so if the investigators don't go down, I would say one of the men who originally went down to inspect the hull could have found an interesting rock and he can show it to the investigators later. Again, it's not essential, but it will kind of help the investigators understand what happened in the scenario. Anyway, after all of this, about three hours later, the ship has been freed kind of by the rising tide or the sinking mud. Uh, however, a monster or several monsters have attached themselves to the lower hull. As I mentioned before, the monsters are Europterids, uh, which are from the Paleozoic era, so not mythos creatures at all. Uh, they eat whatever they can find and have developed a paraly paralytic uh, poison, which will come up later. Uh, there is one mother, uh, about 10 or 12 mature uh, creatures, and an unlimited number of small larval stage ones. Uh, but the mother is the real challenge here. Uh, two days after leaving the mud bank, the ship is starting to take on water, so the captain sends two men down to bilge water out every morning. Uh, but it doesn't seem like it's a dangerous amount. It doesn't look like this, the ship is going to sink. Uh, a few days later, the dolphins return, which is again a sign of good luck. But suddenly there is a terrible cry as one of the dolphins is attacked. Uh, Van Owen comments that he's never seen a shark attack a dolphin like that before. And if you ask him about it, he says he thinks he saw a dorsal fin next to the dolphin. But really, it was the mother Europterid who attacked the dolphin and then reattached herself to the ship. Uh, the following day, there seems to be more sounds of rats scurrying around in the hold. Uh, but it's actually a combination of the larval Europterids and the rats who have to flee from them because they're starting to eat the rats. Uh, the Europterids are afraid of bright lights and they will scurry away kind of like cockroaches at the first sign of light. Um, spot hidden rolls might just about give a small glance, but you won't learn anything yet. Um, another point should see one of the investigators sent into the hold alone to do something and have their lantern crash. Uh, in the darkness, the scuttling soon increases. Um, if it's during the day, it's relatively easy to find the light coming in from the upper decks. But if it's at night, it will be a little bit more of a hectic scramble. Uh, either way, you're likely, or the investigator is likely to feel something strange crawling over their hand or foot. Uh, naturally, though, and you should have learned this already about the crew, if you talk about this monster crawling on your hand uh, in the hold, the crew will definitely make fun of you for being afraid of rats. Um, this would probably be uh, exaggerated even more so if that investigator also believed in the sea creature, uh, the giant squid, uh, in the first leg of the journey. So about a week and a half after leaving New York, uh, Oldfield is at the helm while the others are sleeping, and he is attacked by the mother Europterid. She paralyzes him and drags him overboard. Uh, he lets out one scream right as he is attacked, so uh, with a listen roll, the investigators can hear it, but there's nothing they can do. They can't save him, they can't even see what's happening. Uh, Oldfield is gone, and there's a few uh, drops of blood left behind. The captain orders a search, and everyone looks overboard, but nothing can be found. Uh, so he's he's gone. A few days later, Gordon comes rushing up out of the hold, claiming he saw a monster with many legs, many teeth, and about the size of a dog, and moved very quickly. Uh, any other crew member who hear this will make fun of him, but O'Reilly decides just to check it out anyway, and the investigators are welcome to join him for this inspection. Uh, they don't find anything, apart from the gnawed corpses of some rats, and O'Reilly looks a little bit nervous, but he says it must have been cannibalism by the other rats. And then he jokes that even the rats won't eat cars cooking. So any time after this happens, if anyone thinks to check the crate uh, with the statue in it, they will find a hole in the bottom of the crate 
uh, just a small hole and some of the packaging has been torn out. Uh, a crowbar is required to open it and inside you can find that a family of rats have died there. They found their way, they gnawed their way into the crate and tried to hide there to escape from the Europterids, uh, but they were found but probably by the larval ones. So two days after Gordon sees the monster, Gordon and Vale, who I don't think I've mentioned before, not so pivotal a character, uh, just a, a random a crew hand. Uh, anyway, those guys are up doing the ringing and suddenly Gordon cries out and a few seconds later, he falls uh, down to the deck uh, with, with a sickening thud and he is dead with his neck and his back broken uh, by the fall, apparently. If the investigators examine the body, uh, they can find with a medicine roll that he seems to be too stiff already, uh, like rigor mortis has already set in, but it's way too early for that. A spot hidden roll discovers two tiny wounds in his side and touching them makes the finger. So as you touch them, your fingers start to become a little bit numb. And this is hinting at some kind of poison that was used. Uh, but Gordon's body is wrapped up in canvas and he's thrown overboard with a short prayer as is standard uh, funeral at sea. After this, the crew is becoming disgruntled and starts to talk about the statue. Uh, Higgins says that they've had nothing but trouble since they brought that thing on and he thinks it's probably cursed. Uh, if the crew knows or at any point finds out that the statue is of Lady Jane Grey um, and her ill fate, uh, they become convinced that it is cursed. And Higgins again really wants to throw it overboard. Uh, the captain kind of quells any such talk, but the crew are eager to blame any bad thing uh, such as fog heavy rain, uh, low winds, anything like that, they want to blame that on the curse of the statue. So about two weeks out of New York now, and about halfway through the return journey, everyone turns up for their evening meal to find the galley is empty and Carr, the cook, is missing. Uh, Torkelson said that he last saw him going down into the hold that afternoon carrying a large metal pot. So some men are sent to investigate and the captain asks some investigators to help as the rest of the crew is needed on deck because they're a little bit short-handed. Uh, the ship is fairly fully stacked with cargo, so certain areas will require the party to crawl on their hands and knees to get to places. And often they will hear scuttling noises behind all of the objects, but they can't see anything. But as they're crawling, one of the investigators will reach out and will grab the cook's hair. And he's dead, and he's clearly been partially eaten. Uh, the body is removed from the hold, which is quite difficult in, in tight quarters. And on deck, his dead body is investigated. A uh, puncture wound can be found in his back, which again causes a little bit of numbing if you touch it. Uh, after he's wrapped up and buried at sea, a fight breaks out between Hawkins and Higgins. The captain stops it and demands answers, uh, but neither party is saying anything. The captain orders Hawkins confined to his bunk and Torkelson uh, is now the new ship's cook and actually it says that the food quality improves. So the captain thinks that Hawkins might be responsible for the death of Carr. Uh, Higgins clearly feels the same way, hence the fight. And that's why I said at the start it's important to play up Carr and Hawkins as enemies throughout the scenario and Higgins as Carr as Higgins and Carr as friends. So that kind of just explains what's happening here. It makes it seem a little bit more natural and uh, foreshadowed. So two days after this, with Hawkins still confined to his uh, cabin, uh, Higgins, find that, Higgins finds that the bilge pumps aren't removing the water from the ship. So something must have clogged them. Uh, so he goes down to check on them, but he's killed. Uh, O'Reilly was standing just above uh, the, the entrance when it happened, but he couldn't see anything. Uh, he ordered his, Higgins' body's room body removed from the uh, hold immediately and his left eye is gone and he has a small incision in his fingers again these cause numbing if you touch them uh, the captain asks for an explanation and o'reilly tries to offer one but no one really seems convinced as to how this could happen uh, the body is to be thrown overboard the next morning uh, but now a lot of the rats can be seen even up on deck and even starting to climb the rigging 
Um, appropriate roles or even general sense can tell the investigators that this is unusual as the dark and ample food of the hold suits them much better than the deck. Uh, the captain at this point will call the investigators to his office. He wants to know if they can help out with the running of the ship, given how shorthanded they have become. Especially he wants a cook so that Torkelson can return to his normal duties. A few days later, either a crewman or an investigator will find a mature Europe turret. Uh, the, if it's a crewman, he will immediately f flee back to the deck to raise the alarm. Uh, the investigator, if, if it's them, they can choose to do the same or they can try and fight. Uh, but just remember, if they try and fight, uh, play out the combat, but they might die. Uh, the captain orders, uh, after whatever happens, uh, the captain will order a search of the hold and hopes that at least some of the investigators will volunteer, given how shorthanded the ship is. A spot hidden rolls will give glimpses of the creatures and cause some sanity loss, uh, but proceeding to the lower decks, uh, dozens of larval uh, Europterids and several mature ones can be found. Uh, now they're afraid of the light from the torches, but they will overcome that fear after a few minutes and they will attack if the party stays there too long. Uh, if they do that and then they're fleeing, you might have to, the investigators might have to help some fallen or overwhelmed comrades. And once you get up to the upper deck, you might have to make the tough call to seal the lower decks shut with people still inside. That would be fun to play out. Uh, once everybody who can be brought up to the deck is up, everything else is closed off and everyone is gathered apart from the helmsman. Any crewman who saw the infestation uh, suggest abandoning ship, but the captain won't even consider that uh, at this stage. Uh, Torkelson will point out that the water supply is below deck, and if they go out in the longboat without enough water and, and food, that's pure suicide. Uh, there's not enough uh, food and water on deck, so every day a party has to go down and try and get some more food. But every time they do, there will be some attacks. The captain then starts rationing food and he tries to supplement it with fresh fish that they catch. So just a few days out of England, there is a severe storm for about two days. Uh, this is when the crew is called into action for their regular duties. But of course, they're very shorthanded. Have all of your investigators roll a luck roll and the worst, per the worst roll that person has chosen, even if it's a success. Um, the captain, I think in, in seventh edition, that would just be whoever has the lowest luck at the moment. But anyway, the captain calls out that they have to, that that person, the loser of the luck roll, has to climb up in the riggings to cut a shroud loose that, that's causing some danger. If the investigator hesitates, he will growl at them to take the helm and he himself climbs up. So whoever it is that climbs needs three successful climb rolls. A uh, fail is okay, but a fumbled roll means that they will fall. If that happens, uh, they will suffer 2d6 damage for each previous successful roll. So the higher you go, the more lethal it's likely to be. If they roll a 0-0, zero, zero, uh, the worst roll possible, uh, then they will fall into the sea and they will be lost forever instantly. So if they make it to the top, a dex roll is needed to uh, cut the shroud off without falling. And if you fail that roll, you will fall to the deck taking 7d6 damage, which is almost certainly fatal. Uh, if the captain was the one who uh, went up and did this, and if he survives, he will treat that investigator with contempt the rest of the way. Uh, if the captain tries this, but he dies, the rest of the crew will hate the investigator for their cowardice. Uh, if the investigator does it and succeeds, the captain is very impressed by their bravery. So apart from this, um, turns of two hours must be taken at the helm, um, and anyone who goes out to take uh, their turn uh, risks being swept overboard as well in the, in this, in the terrible winds. Um, after two days of this, you're finally out of the storm and the captain orders everyone to rest, just leaving someone at the helm. After a few hours, a listen roll hears a scream from the deck as the helmsman is caught in the pincers of the mother Europe turret. 
Uh, so this is the first time one this big has been seen properly. And of course, this will cause a lot of sanity loss. Uh, but the mother, uh, Europterid, kills him instantly and drags him overboard. The crew uh, are completely terrified and want to abandon ship, arguing that now the Irish coast must be close and that the ship is no longer seaworthy. If there are any officers still alive, they will consider this, but it is up to the keeper what they do. Uh, the investigators can choose to abandon ship if the others are, uh, or even if the others aren't, uh, or they can stay with it. An idea role will suggest that the creatures have been breeding on the ship, um, and just abandoning the ship is, makes it likely that the creatures will land somewhere and wreak havoc. So maybe the best option would be scuttling the ship. So scuttling the ship, or firing the ship, or killing all the creatures. Good luck with that. Um, if everybody agrees to abandon the ship, there's one last food run which has to be made into the hold. Uh, the investigators should also think about the bust. Do they want to take it or leave it behind? Do they want to take it in its crate or just loose, take it out of the crate? So the longboat has space for 10 people and, and enough space for supplies for six days. The statue takes up uh, one space uh, if it's just a statue or two spaces if it's still in its crate. So you could have an argument between the crew and the investigators about taking it at all. And certainly they would insist about leaving the crate behind if, you know, there's not enough space. Um, but if they go into the longboat like this, they will arrive in County Clare, Ireland, uh, five days later, safe and sound, and they're kind of fine. In that scenario, if they didn't scuttle or fire the ship before abandoning it, uh, later they will hear reports of a village in Cornwall that's overrun by sea monsters and this will cause them to lose a little bit of sanity knowing that they're responsible for it. There's no mechanics given for scuttling or firing the ship so just assume that the crew knows how to do this. Uh, if the investigators stay with the ship they have to try to persuade any officers and or crew that the creatures can be defeated or at least held off. Uh, the crew may last for a few more days, but if they lose more crewmates during the food raids into the hold, they will quickly abandon ship regardless and they can't be talked out of it. The key problem to overcome really is to try and kill the mother. And there are a few different suggestions how to do this, such as trapping her below, maybe setting her on fire, uh, because she's actually outside of the hold as well, um, or possibly having a crossbar fall on her uh, up on deck. Uh, if the Christabel does arrive back in any harbour, the harbour will become infested with the creatures and some of the uh, mature Eurypteids may attach to other ships and start spreading all around the world. So that's the scenario and there's just the wrapping up to do. Uh, if the ship was abandoned, the crew will all agree to say that the ship was damaged in the storm. Um, uh, you know, there was a storm. Uh, talk of monsters would have them labelled as insane and they would never be hired again. And the investigators probably know that they may be better off sticking to this story. There are various bonuses and penalties for sanity depending on how the situation is resolved. But a really important point is what has become of the statue. Uh, if it is saved and presented to Stander, he is very grateful, pays a bonus to each investigator, and pays for the funerals of the deceased. Uh, the investigators will also improve their credit rating as a result of a powerful contact, and he will be willing to help them in the future. Huge, huge bonus for them. If they've lost the statue, he will probably make their lives very difficult. If they can convince him of the ship being damaged and sinking in a storm, he might leave it at that. But he will he will uh, set up some investigation to see what happened. Um, but he will still have kind of lost some faith in them. If they talk about monsters, or if the ship is found uh, washed up somewhere else later on, that means that they didn't scuttle it, he will make it his business to ruin them and their credit rating will suffer. And he could even take legal action against them as well. So uh, that's the scenario. There's actually a lot to it. Uh, I love the idea. The idea of it. 
It's a unique scenario set on a ship. It doesn't use mythos creatures. Uh, there's plenty of red herrings uh, sticking with the nautical theme, but not really in a big way. Just enough to kind of make it very difficult for the investigators to predict what will happen next. So there's lots of surprises, and I really like that. Uh, I love the connection to the temple short story, even if it's just in a misleading way. Um, but I'd say it will probably be lost on most players. There's also a huge, huge swing in the affairs of the investigators, depending on how their interactions with Stander goes at the end. So it can propel them up into uh, the higher echelons of society or cast them way down. Um, and it's always good to have real consequences for your uh, scenario as well. Um, so this can be great. It pre presents a lot of interesting future role-playing hooks as well with a good friend or a, a bitter enemy. Uh, the long journey uh, of the ship also offers the investigators a lot of time to read mythos tomes, uh, learn spells. And these are things that typically can't be done within a single given scenario, uh, more of a campaign or in-between scenario kind of thing. Um, I think that the scenario really works well to gradually build up the horror and the tension. And the boat setting is great because, you know, where else can you go? The main problem with it, in my opinion, is that there is a lot of work for the keeper to keep track of everything. There's a large number of NPCs and many scripted events. And there's so many different options for the players who may decide to just go poking around a lot sooner than expected, which can throw all of your plans into disarray. Uh, although all of the events can be moved, the main story itself is quite linearly written. Uh, it may be good for less experienced players, but on the other hand, there are many fatal dangers which might suggest more experienced players would be good. So finding that balance is a little bit tough. A little bit more fleshing out of key NPCs would be good too, uh, although there's a little section at the end of the scenario giving minor details for them. If this scenario is revamped for the 7th edition, I think it would get a more detailed section on the NPCs. You'll be spending months at sea with them, so you do need to know how to roleplay them. Being at sea means that if an investigator dies, it's hard to find a replacement. The solution for this is to take over as one of the crew. This can sometimes be a bit frustrating for players, but there's no other logical way to overcome it. And, you know, it's just for the scenario anyway, so it's not too bad. Overall, I think it's a great scenario, but the Keeper really has to decide if it will suit their group of players and if it's worth putting in that much work. Um, it's very different from, uh, you know, standard Call of Cthulhu scenarios, which is good, but also probably means a lot more work. It's not a must-play scenario, but it's definitely an interesting story with a lot of different possible outcomes. I think it's worth reading for yourself anyway, at least. Okay, uh, so that is all for today. I, I really thought this review would be shorter, uh, but there's so much going on despite the story being so simple. You know, monsters attach, attached to the bottom of the ship and gradually start attacking more. Well, uh, the next video will be for the excellent... Signs writ in Scarlet, the sixth and final scenario in the collection Sacraments of Evil. Uh, I will try to get that out to you guys by next week. Uh, but don't forget to like and subscribe. And okay, uh, take it easy everyone and I will see you next time. Bye.